Welcome to The Wonder, exploring perspectives, rituals, and observances of modern naturalistic, earth-revering, pagan religious paths. Here are your hosts, Yucca and Mark. Welcome back to The Wonder, science-based paganism. I'm your host, Mark. And I'm Yucca. And today we are excited to have Rune Yarno with us, who is a thinker and podcaster and pagan animist, Norse animist, coming to us from Scandinavia. So welcome, Rune. Thank you very much. Super happy to be here. Rune was suggested to us by one of our listeners who had been listening to Rune's work and said that we could have a very interesting conversation. So we are here to have a very interesting conversation. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> totally yeah thank you for coming on i'm really excited so well thanks for having me it's gonna be super interesting yeah do you want to go ahead and start by just you know letting our listeners know a little bit about who you are and what your background and interests are yeah let me <laughs> let me try <laughs> yeah my name is rune i'm a danish anthropologist of religion and i what i'm trying to do on my general platform, which is called Nordic Animism, is that I'm trying to use indigenous knowledge, scholarship, and new animist thinking to look at our own cultural heritage as your ascendants. Because there's this weird assumption in our time that these are ways of thinking about our own culture that are only available if you belong to an indigenous colonized groups. And that assumption is there seemingly in popular culture and in uh, scholarship and and in all kinds of ways, in spite of the fact that what a lot of indigenous peoples are actually doing is that they're encouraging us as majority populations to start thinking like this about ourselves. But it's difficult for a number of reasons to, to do with cultural politics. It's a diff- difficult step to take. So a lot of, not a lot of people are doing it in spite of the fact that indigenous knowledge is becoming a big thing anyway. So, yeah, so that's basically what I'm doing. And I also feel that when I'm doing that, I'm I'm being brought through dealing with a lot of these problems of cultural politics. Because when you, when you look at, for instance, our culture as Eurasian and people, and also the ways that our traditional culture has been sometimes co-opted, then you are necessarily faced with issues such as, well, racism, whiteness, the construction of whiteness, the rejection of animism, actually, as a part of construction of whiteness, and these sort of things. So, and therefore, it becomes a, a very I think a very intersection, intersectional work that is basically becomes a, a form of, of decolonizing. So, yeah. And I'm then trying to do this to sort of bring this into popular spaces. Because one thing is that, you know, I can sit online and I can go blah, blah, blah in my highbrow, you know, academic language and nobody's going to understand, understand a bloody thing. But what uh, what actually ought to come out of something like this is popular culture stuff that can be communicated to real people stuff that that can also attract actually real people so Mm -hmm. i've launched symbolism of totemic kinship with the world around us i've written a book about the the turning of the seasons and uh yeah different different projects like that and then i'm continuously communicating on my channel yeah. Did that kind of sum it up? Or did I speak yeah. too long? Too yeah. long? <laughs> no, that's great. And that's I have great. to say, I'm so excited to hear you talking about indigenous European cultures, because so often the idea is that, that there isn't, and that that's the, that European is the opposite of indigenous, rather than seeing that there's indigenous all over the world, not just from specific groups. And I think that that's really valuable that you're bringing this to light. Thanks. And I I would just add one little caveat there. Mm -hmm. And that is that when I'm talking about traditional European culture, I actually don't use the word indigenous. And the reason is that when we talk about indigenous peoples, we mostly talk or we are generally talking about people who have been exposed to colonialism. Mm -hmm. That means that If you are in Wyoming and there's a group of Shoshone living there, you know, then when they can, can, then the word indigenous, that to them, that's also a legal 
category that right. it, it means access to fishing rights and land rights and hunting mm -hmm. and access to funding to first language teaching and all these kind of things that we don't need as majority populations mm -hmm. so what so what i'm basically this is just i'm, I'm just saying <laughs> this as because yeah. it's an important little addition that that is important to not actually when we talk about indigenous knowledge i mean and i give you at some level you could call it indigenous knowledge traditional knowledge and in, uh, majority traditional knowledge and indigenous knowledge are basically the same kinds of knowledge but the word indigenous is just a little bit touchy and it's touchy for the indigenous people so it is important to sort of move around it a little bit but like I, I, I definitely get your sentiment we need to be able to speak about our our own heritage in exactly the same or with those categories that you know mm -hmm. authors like robin Kimmerer and these kind of people are using to understand their culture yes Mm. Yes. I, I think the, the first thing that strikes me as, as you speak is that we're definitely on the same page from a value standpoint. You know, we're, we're very, very adamant about the need for decolonization and the, the importance of indigenous and traditional understandings of the nature of the world, of development of reciprocity in our ecological relationships all of those kinds of values. So I, I think maybe that's a good place to start from. Our work has been in building community around a science-rooted understanding of the nature of the world, but a transformation of the value system that informs the way society operates. And it sounds like at least the transformation part of it is very similar, Rune, to what you're you're focusing on. Totally. Um, and I think I would probably also say the science routing. I'm I'm not a natural scientist. I'm I'm and that more of a historian of religion anthropologist mm -hmm. type. But but I don't perceive and this may be where we differ, I'm not sure, but I don't perceive necessarily a contradiction between, for instance, religious languages or animist mythologies, a way of understanding the world, and a scientific way of understanding the world. Mm -hmm. If you look at how an animist mythology, for instance, is typically structured, then you'd find that there are, it's, it's not one package, it's not one worldview that some people kind of buy into and then to kind of adopt that whole thing as if they're in installing a new operative system on a computer it's more like a, a, a jumbled up toolbox with a lot of kind of stuff lying in it and and then you can use it in different ways and it's kind of combined in different ways for different purposes and some of these different tools can be contradictory uh, and mm -hmm. they can be radically contradictory contradictory so the same for instance animist way of talking about say deities can be contradictory from one ritual situation to the next and mm. this also count this counts on many levels in religious practices so if you have a science a scientific perception of the world then in a sense that's also just one toolbox so if you move out of the 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 monolithic ways of understanding the world that have characterized Abrahamic traditions, mm -hmm. particularly Christianity, where, you know, there's, there's kind of one worldview and you have to buy into that. Mm -hmm. If if you, when, when, you, and th I think that would be a pagan step to move out of that. Mm -hmm. And then science just is just this incredibly beautiful, powerful, deep knowledge system, which in itself is like a web of of, of, of roots that that come from all kinds of different places in the world and kind of come together in in occidental science and then then that that does not necessarily need to be in any conflict with creating tal talismans and seagulls and stuff like that for instance sure. absolutely sure. And, yeah and, and we do all that stuff yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah yeah and i mean we understand it as influencing ourselves at a psychological level and transforming our perspective on the world 
we've been talking about animism and throwing the word around a lot, and I think it might be valuable for us to visit what we mean by that. I just wrote a blog post this week about naturalistic animism, and I think that one of the things about the the traditional Western colonizers' view of animism is that it is a supernatural idea that there that a rock has a soul in it, and I think that's a very dualistic, very Christian informed way of understanding animism. I see animism as being about what are what is my relationship with the rock. Do I relate to the rock as a person or do I relate to the rock as an inanimate thing that I can exploit? And that's that's kind of my take on on a naturalistic approach to animism. What what do you think animism is and <clears throat> how does it work? I agree and with some of what you say but not all of it. I okay. think the relationship is absolutely foundational to animism. And in a sense, I think that the relating with the rock is more foundational than if there is any sort of faith or belief in whatever figure that lives inside the rock like be, and and that's because the relationship is important so if you if you look at how for instance new animist theory and and also the philosophers who are doing panpsychist thinking and all these things when when you look at these ways of thinking then being becomes predicated on relating. I, I relate where, where Descartes, the kind of quintessential modernist thinker, would say, I think, therefore I am. So the world is enclosed in the human thinking space. The, the animist position would be, I relate or we relate, therefore we are. Mm -hmm. And that means that, so that, but but if if I should tie that to what you say with supernatural, then in a sense it's it's extremely sort of mundane. Like we are we are in a relation right now, and we're trying to understand each other, and we are sitting in different you know, continents, and you know we we have different positions, and it's interesting, and blah blah blah. That defines, but there's also an exchange of value between us. Mm -hmm. You have a podcast, I'm coming on your podcast. Perhaps some of my followers would go over there, and the other way around. And so there's an exchange going on in that in the relation that we're in right now. Our subjectivities are defined in that in this encounter that we're in now. Our subjectivities are defined by that, right? So. The, con the current perception of a lot of anthropological scholarship would be that, that this relation is inhabited by subjectivity. So subjectivity is not only inside our minds or inside our brains, it's actually in our relation. Now that means that when the Inuit are relating with the sea, which is an all life-defining factor in Inuit life, then their relation with the sea is inhabited by subjectivity. That subjecti subjectivity that inhabits that relating, that is the, the, the sea mother, Sedna, the Inua, they would call it the Inua, the relational subjectivity of the sea. So, and whether that should be called supernatural or not, I'm not really sure, but like, I'm not, I'm actually, I'm not really sure about the word supernatural if it's because it, it, I think it has a heavy, heavy baggage somehow. Mm -hmm. But an Inuit shaman can actually interact with Sedna, the sea mother, and thereby engage that subjectivity that inhabits the, the relation between a group of Inuit and the sea. And that's the same with a stone or with... If, if you have a farmstead in Northern Europe 200 years ago, th this stone could be a kind of a relational hub for the way that the people in that farmstead relates to their land. So it becomes inhabited by, I'm not sure what the word would be in English, but these sort of gnome-like or elf-like beings that would typically work as a patron a spirit mm -hmm. protecting a specific farm or ensuring basically the 
positive and mutually giving reciprocal relating between that group of people and the agrarian life sustenance that they are living with and living from. So that that spirit would be the relationship itself. Am I understanding correctly? Yeah, or the subjective, the, the subject, the subjective relationship. Yeah. Uh, mm, okay. So, and this is sometimes called the individual. So we are individuals from a modernist perspective. That there's an inside us. Mm -hmm. we, but if you take away the 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 uh, in, <laughs> then we are individuating right now because we oh. are producing relating with each other from That's a delightful word yeah it's yeah. a lovely <laughs> word isn't it yeah. <laughs> and yeah. and then what many animists would would say or animist thinkers would say that 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 individuation is a central purpose of religion basically and that it it individuates a relation so if you have a santeria priestess who's being possessed by the storm goddess yang sa and she's dancing around then that human being is individuating yang sa in a number of ways one of them is portraying yang sa people see yang sa in front of their eyes mm -hmm. dancing another part of the deviation is that she's initiated she's crowned as a santeria priestess so so there's some deep mystical deviations that are connected with that and that whole thing but it's basically about producing relating and and ch challenging that subjective relating into the world mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah does that make sense it, am i <laughs> yeah no it absolutely does, does it, feel yeah, good? It, it it absolutely makes sense and that this this focus on on the relationship as i said i think is very core to the at least to my idea of animism and so the the question about the reality of the the gnome elf figure doesn't really even enter into it it's it's not you know because this is all subjectivity it objectivity is not is is not a part of that model it's all about what do you see what do you think about it and how do you feel in relation to it yeah something like that i would say that the reality or the what what you know post christians call the belief in the elf that that is it's secondary to the relation okay. like if if you if you say you have a shamanic perception and you could and you you bring yourself into a trance and you speak to the elf and you ask the elf so what would you prefer the most would you prefer that i cultivate an abstract transcend belief in your in transcendent existence or would you prefer a bowl of porridge <laughs> the the elf is going to prefer the bowl of porridge uh -huh. because that is actually that is an actual exchange of yes. of material and the what what you could almost call the revelation of that relationship is that is core i think to producing an animist way of being in the world so that's not only you giving the bowl of porridge to the stone that is perhaps inhabited by a stone inua or an elf or what we can call it but it's also then receiving the gift being given back from the world now that then you are in a reciprocal relationship with the world around us mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it's that, you know, as you say, as with Robin Wall Kimmerer and, you know, writers like that, it's that reciprocity that is so important. The and and the hardest, I think, for us as, you know, modern Westerners to get our minds around because we are taught, as Christianity teaches, that the world is essentially inanimate and it's a pile of resources here for us to mine and that is the diametric opposite of what we're talking about here exactly um, you know yeah. the the idea that that we can't just dig a hole in the ground and take minerals out and then leave the hole is completely foreign to the way capitalism works exactly exactly and 
And if you look at how traditional knowledge and tales and traditional knowledge and folklore mm -hmm. and the like, they actually express and analyze the rupture of these relationships in your descendant populations. So, and you see this in it, like in a wide kind of array of tales, like the most monumental in Northern Europe is the Ragnarok, which mm -hmm. is the, basically the collapse of the relational cosmos in this kind of e eco cosmos, social, complete crashing. Now, some of the scholars who have been working on the Ragnarok, they say that this myth may have occurred or may have may have been inspired by the experience of climate change in northern Europe in the, the mid sixth century. And often when people are relating mythology to natural history events, you should always be a little bit cautious because sometimes it's just like weirdo shit. But <laughs> but this exact example, the the emergence of this myth and this event, they're actually historically very close to each other. It's a couple of hundred years and the event was cataclysmic. It be, in Scandinavia, populations collapsed and there would have been complete social breakdown. So it was a very, very violent event. And what happened was basically that it was a global cooling that lasted, I think, four or five years. And in Northern Europe, that global, global cooling just meant that summer didn't come for a, 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 a short period, for, for a couple of years. And if you're living in an agrarian, a subsistence agrarian community, then that just means that everybody's going to die, and, oh, yeah. and which is what you see that happened in some areas of Scandinavia. Hmm. So so anyway, so, so when you look at the Ragnarok myth, what you see is that it's it's very much a myth about loss of connectivity. So mm -hmm. the main spark of the myth is a, a divine fratricide. There's God brothers who are killing each other. And then what happens is that the relations between the gods, kind of the forces of order and social coherence, and the Jotna, the giants, the forces of nature, who are related in all these problematic and crazy and in fertile ways in Nordic mythology, that relation crashes completely. And then they start behaving like Christian angels and demons and basically going into like the state of cosmic total war. So that's perhaps the most iconic tale of losing animist kinship. But you find them by, all the way down to today, you see that fairy tales and different stories are sort of this struggling, but also people's experiences. Some farmer is, you know, walking up home from his fields, and then he meets a little meet a little group of elves, and they're leaving. So he asks them, "Why are you leaving?" And he, they say, "There's too much noise here and too many church bells, so we're moving to Norway, something like that." You know, <laughs> and uh, and that is, of course, a traditional knowledge perspective of basically ruptured relation because this relational subjectivity which are these elves that are that is sub subjectivity inhabiting human be human relating with the land that it, when that is torn then that can be experienced as the elves packing packing mm -hmm. their bags and, <laughs> or and or leaving. as the magic going away yeah which yeah. is another and you know, repeated trope in many, many stories about how there used to be magic. You yeah. know, we, we used to have, you know, this relationship, right? And mm -hmm. now it's drained away. It's gone. And many of those stories are actually specific about Christianity driving the magic away. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. That, that There's a tension. There's a tension. Like, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm generally, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to not, you know, go into this sort of, Christianity bashing yeah. and all those things, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> but but there is a tension. The, there's a tension between, and sometimes it's it's, it's pretty intense. Like uh, churches in the landscape in northern Europe, the, if they're big stones lying in the landscape, then typically people, local people, will say it was trolls who were throwing the stones at the churches and all uh. when they were building in churches. So there's almost like a conflict between the the churches and the and the landscape itself. Mm. Mm. So, one of the expressions that I've heard you use a few times is new animism. So, yeah. how does new animism differ 
from our understanding of some of the traditional forms or what does that mean when you're speaking about new animism? New animism, that is a little bit of like it's a scholarship position more than it's a kind of a religious position out in the world. Maybe, but things are also related. But when, when I say new animism, it's because anim, like animism was invented by actually the guy who invented anthropology and cultural scholarship, a guy called Edward Bernard Tyler, who was this sort of Victorian British armchair scholar. And he invented cultural evolutionism in which people are first living in these barbarous state of superstition <laughs> where they are animist infantile animists and and and, and that was that was that was what he thought of animism and then you then he kind of developed how humans would develop on gradually improving stages until they became almost like Victorian England, English just, people just of like his own him. time. Okay, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That, that was a paradigm for, <laughs> for the end of history. So, so, so that was, and, and at that point, the idea of animism was just that everything is sort of animate. However, up through the 20th century, there was the, the, the most progressive anthropologists were the American School of Anthropology, who were at a very early point starting to be permissive to other other cultures, cultural realities, and saying, okay, so there are different cultural realities, and perhaps they're equally good. And there was a guy named, oh, shit, I forgot his name right now. Oh, damn really important guy whose name I should be able to remember at any given point of time, who went and and learned from the, the Ojibwe. Irving Hallow, Hallowell was his name. Okay. So he went and and started learning the philosophy of Ojibwe indigenous Americans in, in the Great Lake areas. I think he went into Canada a little bit. And he, I think he was the first who was kind of saying, wow, he was looking, he was looking at their, their language and saying that they have different grammatical categories. And some of these categories indicate animated personal beings. And some of them are like what we talk about. If I talk about this book, then the word book is in, in English is, it's just an it, you know, and he noticed that what was called animate and inanimate by the Ojibwe was different. So stones, for instance, and thunder and number of different things were animate to the Ojibwe. And he started developing this language where he was like, okay, so these are people, they have a different philosophy about what, where, where there's personhood and where there isn't. So from that came new animist thinking, which is kind of relieved from or dealing with the this bigoted evolutionist heritage of seeing animist as a animism as as something inferior and today the, the this has then become the whole position where where the 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 understanding of what animism is and how it works is is then updated for instance animism is incredibly complex it's not infantile at all, and it's certainly not primitive. <laughs> it's many societies that have animist knowledge systems in them. It's not something necessarily that children practice. It's something that elders practice. <laughs> and it's mm -hmm. something that it takes lifespans to to understand at, at, at a very high level. So, 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 yeah, so that's sort of what's in, in new animism. Mm -hmm. Thank that's you. That's great. Thank you for explaining that. Yeah, that's good. So you mentioned before we started recording that, that you sort of take issue with the atheism of our movement or that you have questions about it or whatever that is. So I thought that I would raise that topic and we could discuss it. Yeah, I've been sort of thinking about it, kind of atheism. <laughs> atheism. <laughs> <laughs> no, I... It it I think my sort of my my question kind of springs from the whole idea of decolonizing. If we have what is called the modern epistemology, like the 
the epistemology is the perception, how we perceive the world. Yes. Then the modern fundamental to the modern epistemology would be a seclusion between human subjectivity and personhood and agency, which is inside our skulls, and then the the dead outside. And I can't help seeing anim- an atheism as perhaps related to that. And that therefore cope like actual actually practicing a a decolonizing would be to say okay but subjectivity and agency is not only inside human skulls it's also it is something that inhabits the world in a in a wider in a wider sense it's something that inhabits our interactions and perceptions in a much wider sense and yeah i just had i just had tr- tr- part of my my problem was to that i have i have tr- i have trouble reconciling that with with an <laughs> with an atheist position hmm. Hmm. i can certainly say that for my part my perception of the outside world is i don't think that that necessarily reflects my idea that there's this dead outside world the living me but rather seeing self as part of this larger system. I'm coming from the perspective of, of an ecologist looking at, you know, my body is an ecosystem that is an open system and the things are coming in and going out. I don't see the need to have a, a, a deity or a God or a conscious spirit that needs to be there for me to be part of a of a living vibrant world makes a lot of sense yeah that's what i said i I feel very much the same yeah because yeah that hard line between the the inner living world and the outer dead world is definitely not something that i embrace at all to me it's all living right but because but just because it's living doesn't necessarily mean that it's conscious or that it's animated by something that one could actually at some point identify and measure. You were talking about toolkits before, and I think that it's it's part of what we do as atheopagans and and naturalistic pagans is we understand that in the context of the symbolic world, we suspend whatever disbelief we might have in in the the literal reality of supernatural phenomena in order to have a symbolic, metaphorical, psychological, emotional, impactful experience. And that is what brings me into deep relation with the rest of the world did that make sense yes it does however when you are focusing on psychology then psychology is a space that is characterized by being inside human human minds and and what i would I don't know, fear or kind of my, I think my, my question would then be if it's psychology, are you then actually extending that perception of, of personhood to the world or I does, because like <clears throat> when you speak to a lot of say scholars today, often psychologies would, or psychology would be a language where for instance mythology can be given a space but that actually maintains the 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 enclosure try to compare this Hmm. with with i had this debate with with a friend of mine who also he was criticizing the literalist idea of mythology so he was saying he was talking about i i believe irish mythology and he was saying but who would believe such a grotesque idea as if Ireland were literally plowed with 
the the fertility god dog does penis in there right and uh, yeah innocent but what if you if we think about relation if we take relationships as our our fundamental way of thinking about these things then and we understand if we understand the plow that the farmer is using when he's plowing his land as imminent with dagda <laughs> see then then when when it's imminence if we understand the the materiality of the plow as n- not as culturally imbued with but in the materiality dagda is there right then then we have actually then we have crossed out of the modern paradigm and into a, a, a this enchanted perception of the world and i think we like i think that is the step the, the, that's where it becomes real in a sense and and the, the, there's a number of co- contemporary philosophers and, and and thinkers who make that 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 enchanting possible Bruno Latour, the sometimes they call it the ontological turn thinking or the Cambridge school, and they're so difficult to read that it's almost it's almost impossible to understand what they're saying. But uh, which which is part of a, I think it's I think it's part of a safeguarding strategy because if you want to say that elves and gnomes are real, then it's it's it then you know scholars are gonna you know it's much uh-huh. much better to say well relational ontologies are possible on the basis of you know concatenated hops of division works or something like that you know <laughs> then people get get busy nodding and looking like they are trying to look like they look clever right but but the idea of imminence that for instance that that objects act chairs invite us to sit on them bowls do hold strawberries they act and the the example with the plow and dagda would in that sense be a a uh, imminent in that sense damn <laughs> it's it, it's difficult for me to 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 get to these things but does th- does it make sense my my it, it, it does questioning it it does make sense i do see it somewhat differently and some of that is because my understanding of the way humans relate with the world is that we create a model of the world in our minds and we re- and we relate to that we we perceive we receive perceptual input we filter that and massage it and in some way invent it to some degree and then you know so all right i receive all this input and i filter it and i decide what it is and okay there it is there's there's the bowl right and so i can relate in a in an i vow sort of way with the bowl whether or not the bowl actually has any sort of supernatural or metaphorical symbolic literal nature yeah and it's it's about what's on me to enchant the world and us as a culture to develop the habits of enchanting the world. So that's that's how I look at it. And I I I mean I think the way that you look at it is is perfectly legitimate and useful. It's just I don't look at it quite the same way. But I think I think I think what you say there makes a lot of sense. Like and it's important to to like I might also be hashing it out in a little bit extreme terms here because of course humans do create models of the world and we are imaginary beings that we have this capacity of for instance imagining stuff that doesn't exist already and then by this insane capacity of projection we're able to to create stuff in the world that that no other creature is is capable of and and that capacity is in a sense i think related to also the story of dagda and all this however w- when you are then talking about the bowl and you're talking about 
what its literal external nature is, then what you're doing, I think, is that you're actually, you're reaching across the divide and you're talking about it in this, what Kant would call the ding an sich, the, the, you're talking about it in itself as, as completely detached from human perception. And, and I, I would say that that is probably so difficult to talk about that, that mm. we almost can't. So perhaps there only is a cultural reality available. And then enchantment becomes, then it kind of becomes a, a question of, do we want a, a boring interesting uh, boring uninteresting reality or do, or do we want a reality where you know we have sex on rock carvings and dance <laughs> around meadows and where there are elves and trolls and and stuff like that is enchantment it becomes more of of a kind of enchantment or no enchantment than a, a question about that there is an exterior truth that defies enchantment Oh man, I feel I'm out <laughs> trouble speaking in straight terms here. No, you're you're absolutely making sense. Uh, the place where I think we may differ is that I find the world as revealed by science to be utterly enchanting. It is miraculous the nature of the universe. It is so inspiring and wonder and humility and awe inspiring that. I feel that without that even without populating it with those kinds of figures, I can still just be in this kind of open-hearted, wondering, loving relationship with the nature with the world itself in a way that demands that I have reciprocal relationships with things rather than rather than objectifying relationships with things. And so, you know, that may just be the path by which I got here, you know, which was through a lot of science. But, yeah, I mean, that's that's the world that I inhabit, is just, you know, that this world is just knock down, drag out, amazing. And... I still want to dance around stones and have sex on beaches and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> no, man. Thanks for that. Uh, yeah, that's it, it's it's beautiful, and I totally I totally follow what you're saying. I think I think science is is an incredibly beautiful and powerful way of looking at the world, and and it has and part of I think part of what I'm what fascinates me with science is that it it has a trickster nature science that thing about always questioning things mm -hmm. that thing about always being critical and being inherently critical of power for instance and also being playful proper mm -hmm. science like a lot of contemporary scholarship you know a lot of contemporary cultural cultural and social scholarship it isn't playful for shit it's just boring <laughs> ass they should they should yeah, they should do something else like pick strawberries or something but 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 scholarship when it's real science when it's real it has a playful or in it and and that's something that 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 yeah but i then what i also think is that if we talk about atheism then I would say that in, in, if we look at research history, history, it's probably a very fairly brief bleep in the history of science that science have understood itself as particularly atheist. And today, with, for instance, new animist scholarship and these things, it's kind of we're kind of we're kind of moving the elves back into the beauty of the scientific perception. So, <laughs> well, that's, that's interesting. I mean, one of the reasons that, I mean, science is young for one thing, science other, other than just sort of the standard trial and error that leads to discovery, which all people have always done. So it's the, rooted in our instinctual way of understanding the world, right? right. But science is a formalized the scientific method is only a few hundred years old. 
Mm -hmm. And during most of that time, there has been a domination by Christianity, mostly in the West, such that you couldn't actually say that you were an atheist, whether you whether your work pointed in that direction or not. So I think that, you know, the liberty, I mean, to be honest, it wasn't really until Richard Dawkins and the, you know, the four horsemen who I have many problems with, let me say, to start with, <laughs> many problems. But it wasn't until they started standing up and saying, yes, we're atheists at the end of the 20th century that it really became sort of more acceptable for a part of the population to start to express that. So it's new. It is. It's it's a new thing. But when you look like at ancient Greece, there were people that were questioning whether the gods existed in any meaningful sense. And I, and I think and you I was just gonna say that I think that the the common perception of what atheism is is dominated by that very recent, very vocal and kind of very negative kind of no, no, no take on the world instead of a, a yes embracing take on the world. Yes. I want to add one mm -hmm. specific perspective to the, to the understanding of history of religions in relation to this. And that is that if you look at the history of religions of Europe, then you have what you call like normative knowledge forms. And, and then what you also have is a considerable space of rejected ways of knowing all kinds of ideas that have been there through history and they gone in all and, and and that's what's sometimes called esotericism so esotericism is this label that basically sort of gives an umbrella term for all the weird shit that's been happening <laughs> for the last 2000 years outside of the normative knowledge mm -hmm. hierarchy so all the astrologies and the kabbalah and the uh, spiritists and the theosophers and all that stuff that all that stuff is is uh, esotericism and when you look at european history a lot of uh, a, a, a lot of is people are always like when we talk about intellectuals that there will always be this sort of at least a kind of a consciousness that esoteric, non-normative ways of knowing are there, but sometimes also direct practice. I think that Darwin was an esotericist. I think that a lot of the, and I, I don't remember, I think he was alchemist or something like that and practicing some ritual Newton thing. Newton certainly was. Newton, Newton. Newton. Yeah. sorry. Yes, you were, you were, you're right there. That was <laughs> the important name I was looking for. No, Darwin, yeah, that was a different story with him. But I think that that part of the like, if you look at the last 150 years, is that that I think in the eight, late 19th century you started having positivism, mm -hmm. uh, if I remember correctly, yes. and that's sort of where you get the very strong split between or where science starts to see itself as in some sort of opposition to other ways of of thinking, mm -hmm. and. Yeah, like uh, the, uh, the there was an old Icelandic professor at the University of Copenhagen, in and my old professor remembered him from his student years, and he had had he had had this this Christmas lecture about gnomes, and that was early twentieth century, and uh, as these sort of learned super white scholars were sitting there and they were listening to him and he was talking about gnomes, at some point they it it dawned on them that that he uh, he believed in gnomes and he told about how he had met them and he was a he was a child and these kind of things and so that was sort of the a, a clash between an early 20th century scholar from iceland which is a bit of a particular story in these things it's a little bit of kind of a insula bubble in mm -hmm. uh, in some mm -hmm. respects and uh, in copenhagen they were like but but <laughs> what is it <laughs> about, about this Icelandic professor talking about gnomes? But yeah. <laughs> well, one of the things before we started recording that you had mentioned was that I'm trying to figure out how quite how to word this, but you're very interested it today in some of the political 
implications of some of the work that you're doing. Is that something you want to speak to a little bit? Yeah, it's, I mean, when I started working on Nordic animism, I, well, I knew all the time that it was important and that it's something that you can like, you can never turn your face away from it. You have to look it straight in the eye just all the time. I just the word these words Nordic Norse Viking stuff you know all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. it just has a load of having been co-opted by all kinds of horrid mm -hmm. political movements and but it's actually deeper than that just that like it's not just hillbillies who are you know driving around in pick up trucks with guns and calling themselves a militia and waving Thor's hammers and these kind of things. It it's 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 on I think it's on deeper layers of our self image and, and self perception mm -hmm. as people racialized as white. And and uh, yeah and and I I feel that I'm getting new realizations of this more or less all the time no not all the time but <laughs> but often with a certain regularity that that when you are thinking with euro traditionalism then it, then it's just there for instance i i think that today i think that that whiteness is almost like shaved like a bowl just talking about balls <laughs> it's almost as if whiteness is shaped a little bit like a bowl so if you want to move out of it then you come close to the borders and then it intensifies and scares you back in so mm -hmm. if you want to if you want to base yeah basically move out of the the whiteness complex then you're going to have to start looking to euro traditionalism and as soon as you come in contact with that you you will start seeing runes and maypires and stuff that has been co-opted by Nazis or other nasty people. So so that and that is sort of a, an inherent paradox, which is a condition for working with these things if you're a white person and realizing that that paradox, realizing the nature of it and and starting to cope with it, is an important feature so that's one re fairly recent realization i also encounter policing actually where most non-white peoples would be like well decolonizing white people what's not to like and what took you guys <laughs> so long <laughs> uh, then scholars white scholars they they often have this sort of they, be, they they don't like that whole idea and 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 uh, then they often frame it as oh there's an inherent potential for nationalism in what you're doing or something like that you know and which there might be there might be and i'm fucking dealing with that all the time <laughs> mm -hmm, right. and and in the dealing with it that's when the stuff becomes very applicable actually if for for thinking about how to be a respectful kind contemporary human so today there are actually i'm familiar with two perhaps perhaps even three like systematic programs that use nordic animism thinking for de-radicalizing right extremists in mm. in prison systems and, and these kind of things mm. so, so 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 you see that the, the I think that when you're moving close to some stuff that feels dangerous and feel problematic, then you're also finding the solu you're finding solutions on that path. Hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it's it's interesting as as I listen to you because what you say makes absolute sense to me in the context of Europe. In the United States, it's a little different because here we are in this completely colonized place. And many of us, like, you know, I've I've had my DNA study done. I'm English, 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 English. Nobody ever stepped out of their lane and actually, you know, even married an Italian, for God's sake. And, but my people have been here for 400 years. I have no 
ancestral or familial memory of any kind of tradition from England. And so my approach has been, I need to create this anew. I need to, I, I need to start from values, values like inclusiveness and kindness and, you know, those compassion, those kinds of values, reverence for the earth. And then from there, build a practice which can draw on some of the symbols and, and you know, folkloric practices like maypoles and things like that, but is fundamentally about not stealing from the indigenous people of this place and instead creating my own understanding of a sacred landscape that I inhabit that I can share with other people that derive from the same kind of lineage that I do and with everybody else who wants it. I mean, you know, anybody who wants it, but I understand that people who have been marginalized, they probably want to reach back to their ancestry, right? And pull that forward. I really don't. I I don't feel a kinship with England. So it it it's just I, I'm just struck by the difference. Mm-hmm. I don't have any firm, fast conclusions about it. I just it it is a, a different experience. No, I think I think what you're doing is probably very important and and give like like i i'm kind of operating in this field where where as an old worlder i sometimes feel a little bit like a target for sort of old world nostalgia and these kind of things Uh... i'm probably wearing a kilt and speaking all gaelic all the time and all these things but but what i actually think is that that over there in turtle island the cultural situation is such an intense mix of and and it's as if the the problems of our age are intensified on your side of the pond the fact of of living on genocided land in a highly creolized and creolizing culture with the 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 descendants of of victims of colonization in your living space probably every single day maybe not for all of you but for many of you probably right Mm -hmm. and also immersed in i i I perceive americans as very immersed in ideological structures that are that are sort of connected with the problem now that means i think that means that that the the real answers in a sense are, are are gonna probably come from from america and 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 stuff like what you're doing when you're thinking like this mark i think is beautiful and and it's and i think it has an aspect of playfulness in it to say hey i've been listening a little bit to your your podcast and how you are thinking with different things and you also like playing with seagulls and 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 have been working on wheels of season like me and these sort of things and I think that playfulness will be an important voice in producing the answers that will bring us to a to a, a decolonial future. Mm-hmm. I also think that one question that I meet a lot and which you also touch a little bit here is the question of cultural exchange. And I think that the ways that people have been talking about cultural exchange in American spaces in the last couple of years have a, have a problematic aspects mm-hmm. when we are not allowed to, or when, if, if all cultural exchange is universally crit- criticized at, as cultural uh, appropriation, appropriation, for instance, that is an essentially nationalist idea, which I've tried to criticize it, which is difficult because you also have minorities who have been sitting there and their traditional culture has been completely overrun with like swarms, like locusts of white hippies. And they've been giving (laughs) statements like, please stay away from our traditional spirituality. And of course, when that is the case, then that makes things fairly easy. You stay away. That's the respectful (laughs) thing to do. (laughs) But, but there's also stories that, that I'm hearing a lot 
and I'm he hearing them sort of in direct personal ways and that I'm not seeing so much in public space. And that is stories about Murricans who are perhaps in very, they're perhaps white Americans or Canadians, and they're in very deep and respectful rela learning relationships with, for instance, indigenous elders. Now, if that's the case, then that transfer of knowledge, if there is a teacher present, then that knowledge is legitimate. Because if you want to challenge that knowledge, then you're challenging the legitimacy of the teacher. And that is a, is, is a or that can very easily be a colonizing practice. If you say, no, 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 that Arapaho elder there, he doesn't have the legitimacy to teach a white kid how to give tobacco to a stone because that's cultural appropriation or something like that. Then you're actually challenging the, the, the authority, the ownership of the Arapaho elder. See what I'm saying? Yes, so, yeah, absolutely. So, and and I, I I think yeah. So anyway, I just wanted to mention that yes. because you mentioned <laughs> appropriation. Now I think it's it's important that that the the way that we are thinking about cultural exchange is is is, is relieved from what I think is a, is a bit too unambiguous condemnation in in the appropriation discourses. I I really agree. It's it's nuanced and. Mm -hmm. Americans are not good at nuance. <laughs> we, yes. we just, we really are not. We're very, very black and white thinkers, most of us. And, uh, you know, a lot of good and bad. And usually we're good and somebody else is bad. And it's, it's an unhelpful way to approach the world. But certainly, I mean, if I were welcomed into a space where an indigenous person wanted to teach me some aspect of their culture, I would feel, given permission, absolutely entitled to incorporate that into my practice. I wouldn't feel entitled to teach it, but I would feel entitled to incorporate it into my practice. Mm. That but hasn't happened you, to me yet. So um, But if you if you if you were part of that practice for 25 years and and then the person said, now you're a teacher. Yeah. Well then, yeah, then <laughs> yeah. see. <laughs> but we run but, into the tricky problem of uh, the outside perception and other people trying to yeah. gatekeep that and yeah. and it's just such a very it's a very raw it's like when you when you've been wounded and it hasn't healed yet and yeah. there's just so many feelings and the nuance yeah. and it's it's really it's something that we, you know we are just grappling with all the time and mm -hmm. i think that there's in certain directions the you know the pendulum swung really far in some ways but it's not just one pendulum Right. There's so yeah. many pendulums going in every single direction at once. And you're just trying to sort through all of this, this generational trauma and guilt. And it's just a yeah. really heavy topic. No, and, thanks for that. Thanks for that. Yeah. Yuka. That, is, that was really well said. And, and I sometimes also feel a little bit like an elephant in a porcelain shop when I'm, I'm, I'm talking to Americans about these things, because I'm sitting on this side of the pond. And when you're interacting with Americans specifically, you, you get the feeling that, that because these things are so intense, then you're talking to people where every single individual is on an MA level in, you know, critical <laughs> race studies because it, because, because it's so intense. And that also means that, you know, I need to be a little bit careful yeah. when I'm kind of throwing out my stay. Ah, oh, come on. You guys need to calm down a little bit on the on the on the critical. It's, it's good to have an outside perspective too though. It is. Right? It's very yeah. valuable to hear that and just hear you know what it looks like from the outside because we don't see ourselves from the outside. Right. Yeah. We just see ourselves in the midst of it going, "Oh, my ancestors murdered and raped my other ancestors. And, you know, I don't know what you are feeling and you're feeling and everybody's angry at each other. And, you know, sometimes it's good just to have that outside perspective going, hey, this is what I see from the outside. Yeah. Right. You know? And particularly in the United States, we have been so adamant about denying our responsibility for the, gen the American genocide the enslavement of Africans. We're still denying those things to the degree that in right-wing states, they're banning teaching about them. And 
what that means is that because we won't acknowledge the wound, we can't heal it. And and so the, the subject becomes very, because it's an open wound, it's very sensitive. You prod at it at all, and immediately people have these really vehement reactions. Yeah. And my hope is that as we go forward, I mean, this younger generation seems to have more comprehension about these issues. My hope is that as we go forward into the next generation, we'll start to come to grips with some of that horrible history. But it's very difficult to come to some kind of reconciliation with people who have been horribly colonized and abused when you won't even admit that you did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think also, like, with these sort of processes, I think the the kind of cultural spaces that we are inhabiting today, primarily the internet cultural spaces, mm -hmm. I think they're probably also doing some unfortunate things to us, like a tendency such as narcissism on social media platforms speaking as a person who has a social media platform yeah, me too. that's all of us here right yeah. <laughs> it's like it it's it's double edged it, yeah. it's a very dominating feature about how how people are reacting and or how people are, are interacting mm -hmm. and 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 like i feel that that i almost feel that if we have the the modernist subject here, the modernist idea of the subject that I spoke about before, where, where humanity is inside a case. And if you if you move into a if you move back in time where people would meet a group of elves that are moving away, that's because their subjectivity is not as encased as ours today. It's a little bit more fluffy like that. Then it is as what has it is as if what happens today is that these these shells they become hotter they become like crystal they become brittle and it's as if if they touch each other then it just goes <laughs> and and then we have these the these so it's almost as it's almost as a kind of an in, intensification of the the modern subjectivity and I don't know what's going to happen but I hope that what's going to happen is that it's going to open somehow again and hopefully in a way where it doesn't explode and then everybody just go mad mm -hmm. which actually sometimes i feel that's what you're seeing I, i've sometimes i feel there's quite a lot of madness going around mm -hmm. like rather crazy reaction patterns uh, mm -hmm. and unfortunately not only on the right wing i mean of course the right wing is like supreme when it comes to madness like i mean now here in 2023 it feels as if it's such a long time ago that donald trump was the president in the u.s but when i think about how how was even i'm not living over there i'm living here and it just feels like oh fuck, you don't know if there's gonna be a civil war in america and what's that gonna do to the world like the it, it, it was such a madness dominated situation such a madness dominated situation and it just felt like it just felt like it really felt like madness had had just taken up this gigantic space in the world that that it it, it didn't used to have <laughs> and like yeah anyway you you probably absolutely yeah <laughs> agree yeah. even yeah yeah <laughs> mm. and I thought of something I wanted to say about this whole thing with yeah, but but I also think that like with these strong reaction patterns and these intensifying subjective borders, uh, then I also think it, that it's important to be a little bit like okay, so now I'm just gonna say it, you know, all cultural exchange is not cultural appropriation. And sometimes when people shout cultural appropriation, it's actually not legitimate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, oh, yeah. There are many cases where, where it's super legitimate, but there are also cases where people are shouting it where it's not legitimate. And there are legitimate cases of cultural exchange, even within between white and indigenous groups. You know? Sure. And Absolutely. and there are there are over claims. I mean, 
I read a rant by an indigenous man who argued that no one should be allowed to use feathers in any kind of religious or ritual context except for indigenous Americans. People have been using feathers and seashells and pine cones and since other before beautiful we were humans since, since before we were humans. Yeah. That is a yeah. birthright of every homo sapiens. And I mean, I mean, I understand the person's outrage about cultural appropriation, but that's just a little much. Yeah, it becomes it, 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 it like I spoke on my channel to this Irish, amazing Irish guy called Khan Magan, who and he was telling about how his ancestors was a file, a a poet, an Irish poet, and that that he was the last person to legitimately carry a feathered cloak, a specific cloak. Mm -hmm. made with crimson feathers that were part of their tradition there. And, and I, I later I heard Monocon there. He spoke with an Aboriginal Australian author that I'm quite fascinated by, Tyson Juncker Porter. I really recommend his book, Sand Talk. And Tyson, he was telling him, hey, man, you should go to, you should go to New Zealand because the Maori, they have actually feather cloaks they make feather cloaks and that is a specific it's a specific sign of of a specific status among the maori so if you want to recover this ancient irish symbol of a specific cultural status as a as a poet a speaker of which, which is also cosmologically super important in in monocon's tradition there then he might be able to learn some of that from or he might be able to learn something about it or rebuild it with inspiration from the Maori. Now, I think that something like that would be an, that like if something like that would become possible, mm -hmm. that would be very, very good. If yeah. people are, ha have wounds that are too deep for it to be possible, then of course, you know, yes. respecting people's feelings is, you know, it's a condition yeah. of building positive relations, which is the whole thing is about. Right. <laughs> so, but, but if stuff like that could be possible, that would be, I think, very beautiful to reach that point. Mm -hmm. And so can we talk about your book for a moment? Because it seems your book is something that you have done digging into the literature in many different languages and, and brought forward some, some traditions to, that people might be really interested in. Yeah, I don't or, know if I've been digging in literature in many different languages. <laughs> well, but, you went like, to English at least two, <laughs> and it's in but, English, so we got three languages there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm I'm a I'm a Scandish movie, and so so uh, so I read read Danish and Swedish, and and that's that, that that's an advantage, of course, because a lot of the research, and I'm a scholar, you know, I'm a nerd already. So <laughs> mm -hmm. so that means that reading these kind of old weird folklore compilations is, is available to me but it is or more available to me than for perhaps to you right so mm -hmm. so what i did with this calendar book here which is called it's called the nordic animist year was that yeah i was in there was a couple of different cal calendrical traditions that i was interested in communicating one of them was the runic calendar where every day around the year they used to have two runes attached to it and mm. these runes like from a from one perspective they just place the day in in relation to a week so if there's one specific rune and in a given year then it means it's a tuesday and next year perhaps it that same rune would mean a monday but then you can look at your rune staff and you can see if if it's a monday tomorrow right <laughs> and the other then marks the is a line of rune that where one of the runes marks the new moon so you know when the lunar month begins mm. and those two the weeks they're fixed on our year so that means that it represents a solar and the lunar moons then represents the lunar cycle so that was a beautiful beautiful example of an animist tradition that nobody it seemed to me that nobody really sort of 
was so aware. Yeah, yeah, you know, you could meet scholars who knew that it was there and a couple of nerds here and there, but it wasn't really communicated into into public space that that system even existed. So, uh, so I took that system and then I sort of worked through also a number, a bit of scholarship on on all the different holidays around the year, because the uh, the uh, the traditional animist year used to be actually rather dense with all kinds of traditions and and so i was i was also kind of inspired again by indigenous scholarship where these people are often they at least in north america and also in australia they sometimes work with calendars as a way of getting back or maintaining or getting back into to connection with traditional ways of knowing mm. And that particular, I think it's just a very strong intuition. And like you've done it yourself, Mark, and I, you know, you can see on your podcast that you were talking a lot about Sawin and Belton and 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 all these different holidays. So, uh, so I basically, yeah, did did this this uh, little book as a, as a kind of a cursory introduction to the the entire year in the in the Nordic in the Nordic area. Mm, wonderful. Well, we'll definitely put a link to where people can buy it in the show notes for the for the podcast. I want to read it myself. It sounds sounds great. I'm excited, yeah. Yeah. And so Thanks. <laughs> where else can people find you? Oh my god. Yeah, I'm on <laughs> I'm on I'm on all those social media platforms that I can't be bothered to mention. <laughs> but, all right. but, but but particularly particularly look for my for nordic animism on my youtube because my youtube yeah. channel that's kind of the the backbone but then i'm also on you know facebook and instagram and even okay. on tiktok and well we'll of... include the links in that then in the show notes <laughs> cool. for everybody yeah and thank you so much this was really amazing you gave us so much to think about yeah. we're gonna be thinking Thanks. about this for a long really time so really really value you coming on and spending this time with us thank you Thank you very much. It was so nice to meet you guys and, and, and have a chat here. <laughs> yeah, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Right.